You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com and you are tuned into Questions for Corbett for the month of January 2019. And as I hope you're aware by now, this is the regular series where you send in the questions and I provide the answers. But this month, we're going to do things a little bit differently. This month, instead of a random hodgepodge mixture of questions, I'm going to be answering questions specifically regarding my recently released World War I conspiracy documentary. So if you have not yet gone and seen the World War I conspiracy documentary, or heard it, or read it, please do go to corporatereport.com slash WWI, where you can get the entire documentary, all three parts, in all sorts of formats, audio, visual, or textual, for your downloading pleasure, completely for free, as with all my work. And so I do hope that you go there and use that resource. But if you have already consumed the World War I conspiracy documentary and are thirsty for more information, don't worry, the Corbett Report is here to provide. I have done a number of follow-up episodes uh, regarding this work. So, for example, I've done a Propaganda Watch video talking about dissecting some of the propaganda from the World War I era. I've done a follow-up podcast episode, History is Written by the Winners, talking about how history is written by the winners, specifically looking at the World War I context and how the history of World War I was written by the winners. And I have provided the complete uh, interviews that were conducted with Richard Grove and Jerry Doherty for that World War I conspiracy documentary uh, that were featured in clips in that documentary. I've provided the full interviews. And of course, as I hope you will have seen by now, I've done a complete uh, follow-up interview with Jerry Doherty specifically about prolonging the agony. So lots and lots of information to go through, and this will be another supplement to this series where I answer questions specifically about World War I. So let's get straight into it. We'll go to the comment section of CorbettReport.com for a a question from a Corbett Report subscriber, Martin, who writes, Dear James, thank you very much for this excellent work. Looking forward to more there is one point that does not make complete sense. Cecil Rhodes, Stead, and the early secret elite dream of an Anglo-Saxon brotherhood slash British world dominance did not turn into reality. After World War I, the British Empire had lost its position as the world's dominant power. It was indebted to the USA, a far more powerful rival than Germany could ever have been. After World War II, which, according to Churchill and de Gaulle, was merely a continuation of World War I, the British Empire was finished. And now, in the 21st century, the Anglo-Saxon countries are ruined and culturally terminally ill. Can it be that Cecil Rhodes and the British imperialists served as useful idiots for the advancement of an entirely different goal, the creation of state power for the international bankers, the Rothschilds, Schiffs, Warburgs, etc.? All along, these bankers had the money to buy a king or a government, but were still dependent on those being corrupted enough to be bought. The creation of a Zionist national state was to change that and to give them military power. World War I allotted Palestine to the Zionists, and World War II resulted in the creation of Israel. Ever since, Israel gets supported and receives unparalleled concessions from Zionists all over the world. Nuclear weapons technology, impunity for crimes against humanity, trade privileges, special payments, free submarines, etc. Which state is at the top of the international pecking order? The US, Britain, or Israel? To all those already crying anti-Semitism, I would like to point out that most Jews have been used as candid fodder all along, and many Israelis are just being used as dispensable chess figures as anyone else. Okay, thank you for the question, Martin. I think there are a few different layers uh, that we have to dissect here in order to come to a fuller understanding of the question, let alone the answer. And I think the first thing that we should address is... The notion that from our, that I understand is very tempting from our post-war perspective, the notion that, well, if there was this secret elite that was engineering things towards this certain goal, then World War I was the plan, or at least the culmination of their plan. It was what they were striving towards. It was what was going to deliver them, supposedly, this, this world order they had envisioned, and clearly it didn't do so, so they were a failure. Well, I think that misreads things, at least on the level of thinking that World War I was the plan, or even the culmination of the plan, any more than saying that the Rhodes-Milner Secret Society clique uh, plan was the Boer War, which they also, uh, as I go through in the documentary, uh, did admit to starting. So they uh, that, w- that was clearly 
part of things that they were involved in. So was that the plan? No, World War I was not the plan. It was not some event that was set in stone. We're going in 1914, we're going to start a world war and it's going to last four years and we're going to get this and that. It was a uh, an event that in their eyes, in the eyes of the secret elite that was engineering various events, it became necessary to achieve certain goals. In this case, I think quite specifically in, in the easiest part of that to understand is to crush the upstart German nation, which was a rising threat to the British Empire. And I, this is no conspiracy history. This is, uh, this is something that was widely known and understood and talked about in great detail even before the war happened, um, the growing rivalry between Germany and Britain. So I think that's one aspect of this. World War I was not the plan of this group. It was just something that became necessary in their eyes towards the goal of achieving their, their ultimate ends. Um, but secondly, I think the other thing, or another thing that we need to look at is your formulation of that as the, um, the Anglo-Saxon Brotherhood slash British world dominance. That was not the ultimate end point that this group group wanted to achieve. Even Cecil Rhodes wrote about how he wanted an Anglo-American establishment order um, that would... Uh, there, he wrote, up, for example, about the world parliament that he wanted that would convene for four years in Washington and four years in London or whatever crazy scheme he had in mind. But clearly it was an Anglo-American order. He was, at that time, as it being in late uh, 20, uh, sorry, late 19th century England in the British Empire and feeling the loss of the greatness of the British Empire. It was at its, perhaps at its zenith, but clearly there were uh, signs that it was not going to uh, uh, attain that or retain that for, for in perpetuity. And feeling the rise of all of these competitors, I think clearly uh, Rhodes and others saw that the Anglo-Saxon bread was going to be buttered, buttered by reclaiming America in some way. And, you know, who would have the upper hand in that relationship is a different thing. But at any rate, it relied on not a British world dominance so much as an Anglo-American order. That was even specifically talked about by Rhodes himself. But as I say, after he died and it that, that group was subsumed by Milner and his acolytes, uh, I think even more so that that shift happened away from the idea of the British uh, English dominance towards an Anglo-American order. Um, so from that perspective, it's quite clear that this group was enormously successful in achieving its aims. The entire 20th century is a testament to that. The rise of the Anglo-American and then the Anglo-American world order. At any rate, it's the same thing. And uh, it, I, I, I think it's quite clear that this, still the banking establishment is roosted in the city of London. That is an exceptionally important part of the the world order that we're living in right now. And I'll point you to a recent documentary, the name of which escapes me at the moment, but anyway, uh, Brock will show it on screen and I'll put it in the show notes for this uh, Questions for Corbett, talking about the, the rule of the city of London and the banking establishment there. So I think there is still an Anglo-American order that exists, and the uh, uh, Anglo side of it is certainly downplayed militarily and geopolitically, but is st still there financially, and the American side of it is uh, uh, clearly the, the military-slash-geopolitical gorilla elephant in the room. Um, but uh, just for more more of a sense of what World War I really did accomplish for this particular clique and its goals, we can turn to even relatively mainline history, Niall Ferguson's The Pity of War, for a pretty powerful summary of the objectives that were actually achieved by World War I. So reading from The Pity of War, quote, What, if anything, was achieved by this Armageddon? Belgium and northern France were cleared of German troops. So were Romania, Poland, the Ukraine, and the Baltic states. The German, Russian, and Turkish empires were diminished. The Austrian altogether destroyed. Hungary shrank. So too did Bulgaria. And Great Britain, which by stages lost most of Ireland. New states were formed. Austria and Hungary went their separate ways. The Serbs achieved their goal of a South Slav state, called, after 1929, Yugoslavia, along with the Croats and Slovenes, as well as the Bosnian Muslims. Czechoslovakia, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Finland became independent. 
Italy grew, though less than her leaders had hoped, acquiring the South Tyrol, Istria, part of Dalmatia, and the Dodecanese Islands in 1923. France reclaimed Alsace and Lorraine, lost in 1871. She and Britain also enlarged their colonial empires in the form of mandates of former enemy possessions, Syria and Lebanon for France, Iraq and Palestine for Britain, who had committed herself to the creation of a Jewish national home in the latter. Cameroon and Togoland were also shared between the two victors. In addition, German Southwest Africa went to South Africa, German Samoa to New Zealand, and German New Guinea to Australia. Britain also snapped up German East Africa to Belgian and Portuguese chagrin. They were fobbed off with less desirable African territory. Sassoon had been right after all in July 1917. It had become a war of conquest. The map, as Balfour said, had yet more red on it, i.e. more British Empire on it. In the British War Cabinet's concluding meeting before the Versailles Conference, Edwin Montague had commented dryly that he would like to hear some arguments against Britain's annexing the whole world. America, however, rivaled Britain as the world's banker. It stood on the brink of global economic supremacy, and President Wilson's vision of a new world order based on a League of Nations and international law was realized if not quite in the utopian form of his dreams. Okay, we'll end the quote there. It does go on from there. But I, I think that does give a sense that much was achieved by World War I, uh, including for the British Empire itself, let alone for the greater vision of that Anglo-American world order, which clearly was cemented into place as the world hegemon at by the end of World War I, and even more clearly by the end of World War II. But... Um, so all of that is to say, I don't think this was a loss, and I don't think that the people who were involved, like the Milner group, for example, and the, his acolytes and people surrounding Milner's orbit, were were losers in this by any means. They they achieved much from World War One, um, but I think that this leads us into the next layer of uh, of answer to your question, which is the idea that is so tempting, and I understand the temptation. But it ultimately leads towards cartoon history. The idea that an event like World War I all happened because one clique desired one aim for one particular set of reasons. I understand how tempting that is. It would be so easy if I could just say, World War I was this. <laughs> and that's all you need to understand. And now let's move on to the next lesson in history. <laughs> World War II was this. And then and then this. <laughs> I mean, it would be so wonderful to be able to summarize decades and you know the loss of tens of millions of lives with a single sentence in a single way. It does not work like that, as I've stressed time and time again and will continue to do so until I think people really start picking up on it. Deep events, large-scale events, world-changing events, like a 9-11, like a JFK, like a World War I, an entire global war, do not happen because one particular clique desires it for one particular reason, and everything is about that. That's that's too simplistic and uh, does not do a service to history. Um, so the idea that, uh, uh, first of all, the World War I conspiracy, I, I hope people realize this isn't about this one group that did it for one thing. In fact, the group that I say is the driving force behind the embroiling of England and eventually America into the war is not even a group. As I stress in the documentary, I mean, it's been called different things, but there is no card-carrying membership that people had to the Milner Group or the Round Table or Rhodes Secret Society or whatever you want to call it. This was a loose association that did include certain people who were very key, clear drivers uh, in this story, like Alfred Milner. But there were many people associated loosely, who may or may not have ex had any idea that such an association really existed, but they you can kind of pick up on it in certain ways. Um, uh, also thinking uh, in the context of uh, a different mainline history book, uh, The Sleepwalkers by Christopher Clarke. Um, he does a good job of showing uh, how the British Foreign Oper Office operated uh, in that time when Edward Grey took over in 1906 and started preparing, really laying the groundwork towards war with Germany, 
it was uh, it, th it was the case where people would be filing reports for the Home Office and reports that showed how perfidious and evil the Germans were and how warmongering and how they must be confronted. Uh, those those reports would be oh the, this is a fantastic um, uh, report we we this is great uh, excellent work we must do this and anyone who had a counter narrative that wasn't so viciously anti German oh this is poor work oh shoddy in that sense you foster an environment where people are working towards a goal that they don't even necessarily know about themselves. They don't know there is a group that is planning this and thinking about this. They just know, if I write this, I get commended, I get promoted, I get accolades. If I write this, my career basically goes in the toilet. Hmm. I, and people, again, don't necessarily need to be told and drawn into a smoky room and, and made part of a... and take a blood oath to some secret society. They just know which side their bread is buttered on and they can be led along. So that's one of the aspects of this. The other way I think we have to get a, a broader handle on this is uh, uh, this is essentially when we're looking at a world war with all of these different nations and empires and and royalty and all of this involved in this gigantic conflict we are looking at it has been likened to it many times but I think it's a good analogy the the warring mafia factions that occasionally you have the scene, <laughs> I harken back to my childhood and uh, the Hollywood programming, uh, Dick Tracy, where the mafia gets together and they decide, okay, we're going to put aside our differences for, for right now. We're not going to kill each other in this room. But hey, wouldn't it all be good if we all work together to get Dick Tracy or whatever the case may be? Um, all of all of us have different perspectives and agendas and we all want different things. But hey, it would be good for all of us if this thing happened. That's the way that we can look at an event like a 9-11 or a JFK or a World War One. It's not one tiny group that's doing it for one purpose and one purpose only. It's a number of players can be drawn to the table because there is something in it for them. And something and quite really in it for them. Not just necessarily an airy-fairy promise that doesn't materialize. For, for the winners, it clearly materializes. For the losers, not so much. But everyone is drawn to the table for different reasons. So saying that it was... The, the Zionists that did, did World War I to get the Balfour Declaration is, uh, again, a cartoon reading of history. And one that eh, I, th I find particularly funny because it plays directly into Zionist propaganda. Um, uh, as I pointed out, uh, if you go to Balfour100.com, you can actually see the, the Balfour Declaration, and you can see all of the drafts and revisions. The Lord, Th Lord Rothschild draft that kicked things off in July 1917, and then going to Arthur Balfour, then going to Alfred Milner, then there was the Milner Amory draft, which became the Balfour Declaration that was handed back to Rothschild. So you can see the development of this as a carefully worded document, and the actual wording, of course, as I'm sure you all know, her, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, which means, precisely in legal terms, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Nothing. This is not saying creation of a state, a nation state, a Jewish national home, or, or a national home for the Jewish people, I should say, in Palestine. Now, one thing, of course, as I'm sure everyone is aware, at that time that this document was passed, it was not a British mandate at all. So Britain had no interest in authority over ability to say anything about Palestine at the time this document actually was issued, um, which is one of the things we have to keep in mind. So it had no legal force in, in that sense. And also, the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people, again, does not mean anything. It does not mean the creation of a state. It, a national home for the Jewish people really literally could mean anything. Just a community that lives within the state of Palestine, which could function as a separate state. That's one of the interpretations. And again, we have to understand this was a carefully worded document that went back and forth over many drafts so that they would arrive at this legally meaningless jumble of words that, of course, in retrospect, saying, yeah, but 30 years later, we saw the creation of Israel. 
is is itself Zionist propaganda, so that they can go back and say, yeah, yeah, th- this was part, this was a, a key stepping stone in the creation of the state of Israel. No, it was not. And that's Zionist propaganda, that they want you to believe that the creation of the state of Israel has this big pedigree and it was signed off on by the British government. It was not. And go back and read the Balfour Declaration. So anyway, and that's just to say the idea that the entirety of World War One and all of this, the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the, the fall of the the Ottoman Empire and the carving up of Africa and and the the destruction of Germany, all of this was for the Zionists to get a Balfour Declaration. It's just cartoon history. And uh, I I guess the fourth layer of this to say uh, which is the top of the international pecking order? Is it the US or is it Israel or is it Britain? Again, let me stress once again, at the, that level of the 3D chessboard, nation states are not important. The, 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 the elite, the whatever you want to call them, the secret cabal, do not care about nation states. They use them as chess pieces, exactly as in World War I. Hey, let's take this one and smash it into this one and it'll splinter in a thousand ways. Great, who cares? They, they are not ad- adherents to any particular nation state. That is not the point of this. Now, I think one of the things that you do get to the heart of, Martin, is the idea of the, the supremacy of international banking taking over precedence, any sort of pre- pre- uh, idea that there were nations or or royalty or uh, things were structured along those lines. No, clearly international banking clearly uh, achieved supremacy in the 20th century through things like the World War One and World War II conspiracies. But that's the level at which we should be in analyzing this, more so than at the nation-state level. So there's a lot... <laughs> of answer there because it is a big question but it does open up that 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 box um to to get us to look at this more deeply because again i think people put on these blinders where everything has to be this one group or this one explanation and nothing else matters we can discard, just completely ignore the entire rest of everything that's going on because there's this one explanation and that one explanation may make sense absolutely and it may be true but there are other things going on as well. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And there are many different people at the table here that had many different objectives. And I think that's the the most useful way of analyzing something like this. Or, as I say, 9-11 or JFK or any of the big deep events, the world changing events. All right, uh, we'll leave that there for now. Uh, thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, I, it's good to be able to address some of that. Um, but let's move on to another question from another Corbett Report subscriber, this time M. Key, who had this question in the uh, comment section. Is it not a historical fact that the German embassy in New York took out an ad in the New York Times warning possible passengers of the much probable sinking of the Lusitania? I think that could have been worked into the presentation since it shows widely available advanced knowledge preceding the talk that had been uh, had about it hours before the event. Okay, thank you, M. Key. Yes, indeed, you're right. That is a fact. A fact that, of course, I did mention in episode 343 of the podcast, Debunking a Century of War Lies. In 1915, the RMS Lusitania, a British ocean liner en route from New York to Liverpool, was sunk by a German U-boat 11 miles off the coast of Ireland. The ship's sinking, which resulted in the death of 128 of the 139 Americans aboard, became a symbol of German evil and helped psychologically prepare the U.S. public for their country's eventual entry into World War I. But every facet of the story of the Lusitania, as it has been presented to the public, was a deliberate lie or a lie by omission. The boat was not a purely civilian vessel, carrying 3,813 40-pound unrefrigerated containers of cheese and 696 containers of butter, as the official manifest held, but gun cotton, in keeping with the shipment's stated destination, the Royal Navy's weapons testing establishment. It was not sunk by the German torpedo boat, but by secondary explosions from the munitions the ship was illegally carrying. It was not the victim of a cowardly German surprise attack. The German embassy placed a warning notice about the Lusitania in 50 American newspapers right next to Cunard's own listings. And the American ambassador to England at the time, Walter Heinz Page, wrote to his son five days before the ship was sunk, asking, 
If a British liner full of American passengers be blown up, what will Uncle Sam do? That's what's going to happen. So what did the official cover-up of the incident conclude? That the dastardly Germans had waged a perfidious sneak attack on an innocent peace boat, of course. And the rest, as they say, is history. Okay, so thank you, M. Key, but yes, I was aware of that information. No, it was not included in the documentary. Yes, it arguably could have or should have been included in the documentary, but I really hope that the viewers of this documentary can appreciate how remarkably, unbelievably difficult it is to condense this amount of information and material into one hour and 40 minutes, let alone one hour and 40 minutes that provides enough context that all of these moving pieces make sense and form a coherent narrative. It's extremely difficult. So <laughs> thank you for including that in the comments. But yes, this is not by any stretch of the imagination meant to be the one be all and end all of World War One history that one needs to watch. If anything, this documentary is an implicit plea for the viewers out there or listeners or readers of this documentary to please start exploring the various sources that I'm pointing people to here for the bigger picture and all of the details and facts. I mean, I could make an entire podcast episode. I can make an entire documentary about the Lusitania itself, but that would be a different work than this work, which was trying to set that in a larger context. So, yes, thank you, Emke, and thank you to all the other people pointing out things here and there, but yes, uh, unfortunately, there's, uh, there's blood on the cutting room floor and choices have to be made about what facts are included where. Anyway, won't dwell on that, but thank you for that, uh, Emke. Uh, let's move on to the next question, this time a question that was recorded via the SpeakPipe audio pa application on my contact page, coming from Hans. Uh, dear James, this is Hans. I just saw your World War One conspiracy uh, report, and I wanted to know: um, Do you have a German translation for this, so the Germans can see this? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, thanks. Bye. Thank you for the question, Hans. The simple answer is nine. <laughs> Nine, right? <laughs> That's what you say, right? <laughs> no, I don't speak German, except for Autospiegel, which my uh, Austrian roommate taught me when I was living in Dublin. <laughs> but other than that, no, I don't speak German. I don't have a translation of this in German, um, at least not that I know of. Maybe someone out there has translated it, but no one's uh, told me about it. Um, as with all of my work, I do encourage people out there who are willing and able to in translate any of my work into other languages, please do so. You are absolutely free to do so. I personally cannot use that translation in any format other than a .srt file. And if you have no idea what that is or how to create one, but you're interested, I will put a link in the show notes to an explanation of that um, so that you can figure out how to do that. But that's, that's the only file type that I can use. It's basically a caption file that I can just put on the video and people can watch the captions. I can't really use your translations in any other format, text or, or whatever. Um, but if you want to go and translate it and whatever, post it on your blog or post a, a, a translated video up on, on any other video sharing site, whatever, go for it. Do it. Please do so. You do not need my, uh, my permission. Just go for it please spread this work, and thank you for doing it. I do appreciate it. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. This time, uh, from the mailbag, we're going to get a question from Catherine, who writes, I love your work. I just finished your three-part series on the World War I conspiracy. Are you going to follow up on the whole Trotsky thing? Who specifically was funding him, and why? I've read it was to promote communism in Russia and funded by the U.S. bankers, but I haven't seen a good explanation as to why. Also, I have yet to see any documentation of this idea that the U.S. funded the communist revolution. Well, you are in luck, Catherine. Good news, because I have some late bedtime reading for you. <laughs> Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, the remarkable true story of the American capitalists who financed the Russian communists by Anthony C. Sutton which uh, I've referred to many, many times, and of course he was included in part three of that documentary, talking a little bit about that Trotsky story in an interview that was recorded. But if you want the facts and the details and the documentation about that story, 
then you're going to have to turn to some actual books. You're not going to find it in YouTube documentaries or interviews. And don't worry, there is plenty of documentation for you in this book. In fact, I do have to forewarn uh, viewers and listeners who are interested that this is, this is not light bedtime reading. This is not an easy page-turning kind of book. It's not, a, it's not really a narrative per se. This is just lots and lots and lots of facts and data. Um, a lot of it called from State Department decimal file archives, but um, correspondence and other things, um, uh, the company information, board of directors, how this person was related to that person who sent this message to that person saying this, just oodles, oodles of data and information painting the picture very clearly about how the banksters funded and aided and pushed and openly promoted and otherwise enabled the Bolsheviks. It is a gold mine of info, but as I say, it's not it's not light reading, but it has absolute a lot of documentation. As to that question of why, you know, it is so it's so amazing. Like how can how can the bankers be funding communists? Aren't they the exact polar opposites? Well, of course, that's what we're led to believe, but that is not the truth. Um, it is. I mean, there, there are, uh, there's a lot of nuance to it and a lot of things to, to say with regard to that. So I will point you merely to the uh, chapter 11, the alliance of bankers and revolution in this book, where he lays out, I think, the best summary that you can about this case. But I'll also point you to a recent editorial I wrote about how uh, uh, bankers hate free markets. That's an important point to understand here. Um, that again is the exact opposite of what we're led to believe. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the answer to your question, Catherine. So, um, enjoy. Okay. Let's turn on that note and on the note of a lot of the, the answers that I've been giving here today, let's turn to this question from Philip who writes, I'm just delving into this world war one info. What books do you recommend? Okay. Excellent. I'm glad you asked because Boy, have I got some reading for you. Um, a lot of it, I, uh, you'll already know because I've cited it in various ways and various works that I've been doing in regards to this World War I series, but let's go through them one by one so that you have a reading list. And again, of course, this is not a comprehensive reading list of everything you ever need to know, but it's a pretty good start, and trust me, <laughs> it'll keep you occupied for a week or two, <laughs> I, would, I would think. All right, the first book, again, that I'm going to recommend is, of course, Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War by Jerry Doherty and Jim McGregor. I think if you only read one volume, I would say start here. Anyway, this is a good starting point for this story. Um... Again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of carefully sourced, footnoted, documented documented evidence about this story, the World War One conspiracy, and, and specifically how it came came about, who started it and fomented it. The origins of the First World War is in this book. Uh, when you have devoured that, you can, of course, move on to the follow-up book from Dr. D. McGregor, Prolonging the Agony, How the Anglo-American Establishment Extended World War I by Three and a Half Years. A uh, remarkable tale of uh, the v many different ways in which World War I was artificially prolonged, um, which is a mind-boggling concept, but again, lots of detail. For a window into that detail, you can look at my recent conversation with Jerry Doherty. But that's, again, only a taste of the information that's actually documented in that book. Another book which I cited in a Propaganda Watch episode on if voting changed anything is Lord Milner's Second War, the Rhodes Milner Secret Society, the Origin of World War I, and the Start of the New World Order. A, uh, another treasure trove of information that in some cases overlaps with hidden history, but there's other information about Milner and the group in here that wasn't in that book. So it's a great supplement, uh, a very good book um, by John B. John P. Cafferkey. Uh, another book that gives you a nice window into the story, of course, The Anglo-American Establishment by Carol Quigley, who lays out the um, I mean, this is the source for a lot of information about that Milner, Rhodes, Roundtable, whatever you want to call them, that group, and how they developed and, and what they did in the first, the first half of the 20th century. Anyway, um, this is the history of the 20th century that they don't teach you, even though, of course, as you know by now, Carl Quigley, a very mainstream, very mainline 
um, professor who uh, was in line with this secret society and agreed with them and was on board. The only thing he thought was, why do they want to keep it secret? They should let people know about this. So he he wrote uh, The Tragedy and Hope, and of course, as you know, the place got demolished and destroyed, and uh, the publisher wouldn't publish it again, and this book didn't get published till after his death, and... He just couldn't figure it out. What's going on? Why don't they want people to know about this? <laughs> um, uh, the uh, As I've just referenced, of course, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Re- Revolution, an important window into that aspect of this story. And as I say, incredible amount of detailed, documented information here. Not a page turner by any means. It can be a bit of a struggle to read through. But if you're interested in that history and the documentation, you will have... Uh, more, more of it than you can handle in that book. Um, another book that um, provided some, some good information was The Creature from Jekyll Island, A Second Look at the Federal Reserve by G. Edward Griffin, um, that has some, it's not a huge amount, but a few chapters in here relate to World War I and the Federal Reserve and the bankers' involvement in uh, fomenting and uh, profiting from World War I. On that note, I guess I can also direct people to All the President's Bankers by Nomi Prince. Uh, she only has one chapter, basically, on World War One, but uh, some valuable information in there. Um, now, those are my physical books that I physically have in possession here, but various books that I have in ebook and audiobook formats uh, include uh, The Two Edwards, How King Edward VII and Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey Fomented the First World War by Peter Hoff, who of course was one of the featured interviews in the World War I conspiracy documentary that goes into more detail about uh, the Edward VII and Edward Grey um, role in fomenting the First World War. Uh, Another book which I referenced in my history is written by the Winners uh, podcast that I think is very well worth your uh, time. The Innocence of Kaiser Wilhelm II, which, as I explained in that episode, um, does an excellent job of providing a very reasonable, coherent explanation for all of the things that we're expected to believe of this warmongering, bloodthirsty Kaiser Wilhelm II, who's going down in, who has gone down in the history by the winners as this crazed tyrant. Well, there are very reasonable explanations from the other side of things, and uh, Christina Croft does a great job of elaborating those in that book. Um, Another book, which I referenced earlier in this particular episode, uh, The Pity of War by Niall Ferguson. Niall Ferguson is a mainstream writer, but I think he's probably right on the fringes of the mainstream. He's about as far away from mainstream opinion as you can get while still being a mainline critically reviewed author. And, uh, uh, maybe that's the Cambridge connection. Instead of Oxford, he's, you know, that five degrees away from center. <laughs> but uh, uh, Pity of War is is a good book. Um, uh, it has it has some interesting... I mean, there's a lot of information about uh, the different uh, fiction and poetry and things, not only in English, also in other languages, but also in English, um, that that was written before World War One and uh, during the, and the time of World War One and how the canon cemented afterwards. That was an interesting part of that story for me, but only that's only a slight sliver of a section of the book. Also, a lot of the book refo- revolves around uh, questions regarding financing of the war and and who you know what what um, bonds were being issued by who and and how that affected this and that. Uh, an interesting take on it for someone who Niall Ferguson has studied. Um, the ascendancy of money and, and the banking interests. So he has some interesting takes on that. Um, and in the end, he actually does conclude that it would have been better if Britain had stayed out of the war entirely, which is, as I say, about as, that's the fringiest mainstream position you can take, that Britain shouldn't have enter, entered the war at all. Um, so, and, 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 <laughs> and Ferguson is definitely a contrarian at heart. Everything he says is trying to demolish some some verity that other historians take for granted. So it's a kind of funny just from that perspective. Almost every single paragraph is something like, well, most people think this, but that cannot be because this, this, and this. <laughs> anyway, it's it's worth, a, it's worth a read if you are this far down into the reading list. Anyway, um, also, I will direct people to The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914, which, of course, ultimately is the, uh, the sort of modern formulation of the First World War. Um, I mean, it's positively reviewed in Foreign Affairs, the CFR's rag and all of this. So it's clearly mainline history and clearly it's, uh, oh, well, no one was trying to get us into war. But 
Uh, having said that, there is still a lot of valuable information and details about the war in there. And as I say, for example, I cited it in this episode talking about the Foreign Office under Gray and how that um, how that functioned. And there, there's other things like that that are valuable pieces of information in there for people who are seriously interested in really delving into World War One. As I say, I, I think I would start maybe at the the top of this reading list and work your way down. Um, um, but anyway. There's a lot of information there. <laughs> As I say, I hope that keeps you occupied for a week or two. <laughs> Just to light several thousand pages of reading for you. Um, uh, but we'll we'll leave it there. Uh, I think that's a pretty good reading list for today. Uh, let's end on this note. Um, a couple of corrections um, to the World War One conspiracy documentary. First of all, uh, there was some confusion... Uh, and mea culpa, my fault, in the part three of the World War I documentary, some confusion between Nathan Rothschild and Walter Rothschild. Nathan Rothschild being part of that original inner clique of the Rhodes Secret Society, um, who, who was in cahoots with Rhodes. Walter Rothschild being his son, who was, uh, uh, who was the the Rothschild to whom the Balfour Declaration was addressed. There was some conflation of those two things in the documentary. Those are different people. Um, but anyway, obviously, both Rothschilds. Uh, another correction, uh, at 18 minutes and 47 seconds, or thereabouts, of the part three, uh, A New World Order, uh, of this documentary, uh, when I'm talking about Canadian press censorship, there is Le Canard Enchaîné uh, featured on screen, which... Not only is a French newspaper, but is a satirical newspaper. So, uh, yes, thank you to the eagle-eyed viewer who found that and pointed that out. There was Canadian press censorship. That image on screen is not a reflection of that. So just keep those two things in mind. Uh, obviously nothing, you know, that derails the, the documentary, but we sh should put those, uh, those corrections on record. Um, well, that's going to do it for this month, uh, for this edition of Questions for Corbett. And we'll be back in the future, but I am liking the idea of, instead of just random hodgepodge of questions, doing focused Q&As on certain topics. I think that's that's interesting for me, so I might explore that more thoroughly in the future. Anyway, we'll see how that goes. Keep your questions coming in through CorbettReport.com, and I will be putting them in the big mailbag. Um, and, of course, the best way, of course, as always... Uh, for members of CorbettReport.com to leave your questions in the comment section. As I say, that's going to do it for this month uh, for questions of, for Corbett, but of course I'll be back with plenty of podcasts and videos in the meantime. James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again very shortly. <laughs>